Welcome to The Flowered Path, a podcast about saints, folk saints, miracles, and visionaries. I'm your host, Timothy Renner. The inspiration to create this podcast came to me after what I feel was the repeated intercession of saints on my behalf, but I've always been fascinated by these extraordinary people. The approach to this podcast is going to be rather random. It's not going to be based on the calendar or on saints' feast days. It's going to be based on my interest or a random choice or by synchronicity. If I feel a particular saint has caught my attention for whatever reason, that's probably the saint I'm going to do a podcast about. This is not strictly a history podcast. I am as interested in the legends around these saints as much as the history. I think there's value in both. Sometimes legends can get to the heart of the story via symbolism, likewise with the visions and miracles associated. I tend to believe, but if you don't, I don't want to argue about it. If you're not a believer, perhaps you can just enjoy the stories as folklore. If you're a listener to my other podcast, Strange Familiars, thank you for checking out The Flowered Path. If you're familiar with our hermit episodes over at Strange Familiars, The Flowered Path will be somewhat like those. I will only occasionally have guests. Sometimes those guests will be voices you recognize from Strange Familiars. The Flower Path episodes will vary greatly in length from a few minutes to hours, depending on the saint, my research, and the materials I can find. A legend of St. Leonard inspired the name of this podcast, so I felt it's fitting to start with him. St. Leonard of Nobla, his feast day is November 6th. He is the patron saint of women in labor, prisoners of war, prisoners in general, and horses. In the Alpine regions of Bavaria, St. Leonard is considered the patron saint of farmers. He lived in the 6th century A.D., St. Leonard was a very popular saint in Western Europe during the Middle Ages. Not much is documented about him until the 11th century. What is written at that time is considered more romantic legend than history. It was said St. Leonard was born of noble birth and found himself in the court of King Clovis I, who was his godfather. Clovis was a king who consolidated the various Frankish tribes. He established the Merovingian bloodline, which would survive for 200 years. He was an important ally of the Byzantine Empire. He was married to a Catholic princess from Burgundy named Clotilda, who was herself a saint. Saint Remigius was a friend of King Clovis. He aided in his conversion from paganism, along with Saint Clotilda and Saint Vidastus. Both Clovis and Leonard were converted during Christmas of the year 496. St. Remigius devoted his life to the conversion of the Franks to Christianity. He was elected Archbishop of Reims when he was just 22 years old. Among his other great works, St. Remigius was responsible for the conversion of St. Leonard. As a disciple of St. Remigius, St. Leonard was given the right to visit prisoners and free any one of his choosing. He was responsible for the release of many prisoners, and it was said that King Clovis promised to release every prisoner Leonard visited. Leonard himself, being of noble Merovingian birth, would have been titled to a bishopric, but he turned down the offer. Instead, he chose a contemplative life and entered a monastery near Orleans. This monastery was under the direction of two other saints, St. Mesmin and St. Lai. Before long, however, Leonard decided to live away from people, even his fellow monks. He built himself a small cell in the forest of Limosa and became a hermit. From here, he would sometimes go forth to preach in the Aquitaine, and his reputation as a holy man was such that a number of followers came to the forest to be near him. King Clovis had built a hall in the forest of Limosa to stay in when he went hunting a sort of vacation home. On one hunting trip, he brought his queen, presumably Catilda, who was pregnant. While they were staying in the hall, the queen went into a pained labor. 
Her labor lasted a very long time, and everyone there believed she and the child would perish. As St. Leonard walked through the forest, he heard the cries of sadness and distress coming from the king's hall. The king, not recognizing the hermit, demanded to know who he was, and when Leonard answered that he was a disciple of Remigius, the king thought he might be able to help, so he brought St. Leonard to the queen. By St. Leonard's prayers, the child was delivered. Both mother and baby were healthy. In gratitude for this, King Clovis offered to give Leonard great quantities of gold and silver, but St. Leonard refused, saying that he didn't want for riches. It was only his desire to serve God in those woods. So the king offered to give Leonard the entirety of the forest, but again Leonard refused, instead asking for only as much land as he could ride around on his donkey in one night. The king granted his request. On this land, Leonard formed a community, which eventually turned into a monastery. This was called the Abbey of Nobla, and later became the town of St. Leonard. It was said that the water source for this monastery was two miles away, but Leonard dug a dry pit and prayed over it, and the pit was filled with clean water. Because he was known to free prisoners, prisoners would often invoke St. Leonard's name and see the shackles break from their hands. Many would come to him, bringing the heavy chains as an offering. Those who stayed were given land by St. Leonard on which to live and farm. Even after his death, many prisoners credited the intercession of St. Leonard for their release. In the year of 559, St. Leonard died. The Abbey of Nobla became a place of pilgrimage, especially for returning prisoners of war. So many pilgrims came to visit the site of St. Leonard's church and monastery that the facilities there could not accommodate the crowds. It was decided that a new church should be built in which St. Leonard's body would be interred. There was three days of prayer and fasting after this decision. On the third day, the people found that the entire forest was covered in snow except for the spot which would become St. Leonard's resting place. In this spot, they built St. Leonard's tomb and the new church, and the broken chains and shackles of freed prisoners adorned his grave. There was a nobleman in the region who built a dungeon in his tower. This was made to strike fear in his enemies. In it was a massive chain affixed to a pillar, in a room of total darkness. And those who were chained to this pillar in darkness suffered greatly. It was said that prisoners who died in that darkness suffered more than one death and a thousand torments. One of St. Leonard's disciples was falsely imprisoned by this Lord and chained to the pillar. After suffering greatly, he was nearly despondent, but he prayed for St. Leonard's intercession. St. Leonard appeared to him in white robes and said, Fear thee nothing, for thou shalt not die. Arise up and bear thou this chain with me to my church. Follow me. The prisoner stood and followed the apparition out of the tower and to the gates of St. Leonard's church. Now freed, he entered the church and told of the miracle. He hung the great chain on St. Leonard's tomb with the others. Another lord in the region had heard tales of St. Leonard freeing prisoners from shackles. He had taken one of St. Leonard's disciples captive but he was afraid if he put him in shackles, the man would just call upon the saint and be freed. So this lord had a deep pit dug in his tower, and the prisoner was tied with many kinds of binding and thrown into the pit. A heavy wooden cover was placed over the pit, and armed men placed his guards on the top. The lord said that even if St. Leonard should break the prisoner's bounds, he would still be held in the pit, guarded by soldiers. And the prisoner in the pit cried out to St. Leonard often, until one night the saint appeared. St. Leonard turned the wooden lid of the pit so that the guards were sent into the pit, and he appeared illuminated by a bright light and said to the prisoner, Sleepest thou or wakest? Here is Leonard, whom thou so much desired. Astonished, the prisoner cried, Lord, help me, and the bounds fell from him. St. Leonard took the prisoner in his arms and carried him from the tower. They spoke as friends for a time, and St. Leonard sent the man home free. On another occasion, a pilgrim returning from visiting St. Leonard's tomb was accused of trespassing by a local prince. He was held captive until such time that he could pay a steep fine. Unable to pay the ransom, the pilgrim said to the prince, The ransom is between you and St. Leonard, to whom I submit the matter. 
The following night, St. Leonard appeared to the prince and demanded the prisoner should be freed. In the morning, the prince believed that this was just a dream and ignored the saint's request. St. Leonard appeared again to the prince the next night, and again the prince refused to set the pilgrim free. On the third night, St. Leonard appeared to the pilgrim and led him to freedom. As they departed, half the castle and the tower crumbled behind them. A great many people were crushed in the collapse. Only the prince remained alive, badly injured in the rubble of the castle. A knight was imprisoned in Brittany who called upon St. Leonard to free him. St. Leonard appeared there. The guards, knowing the reputation of the saint, were afraid. They broke the chains that held the knight themselves and placed them in his hands, setting him free. In one Bavarian town, St. Leonard's intercession was credited with 4,000 cures and answered prayers between the 14th and 18th centuries. Many towns and churches bear St. Leonard's name from Europe to America. In Sussex, England, there's a woodland. In the 6th century, this forest was said to have been inhabited by a dragon. The foul creature devoured men and cattle alike and left in its wake a trail of slime and death. St. Leonard took it upon himself to rid the forest of this menace. They had a great battle, but eventually St. Leonard defeated the dragon. However, he was wounded during the fight. From every drop of St. Leonard's blood which fell upon the forest floor, a white lily grew. God asked St. Leonard what he would like as a reward for slaying the dragon. St. Leonard asked that the adder would lose its venom, and the nightingales cease to interrupt his prayer with their singing. A traditional rhyme about the forest states, Here the adders never sting, nor the nightingales sing. In the 16th century, Dr. Andrew Board, an ex-monk who wrote several books on topics ranging from medicine to astronomy, noted about St. Leonard's Forest, The nightingales would not sing there because they disturbed the devotions of a hermit who resided in the forest. Another version of the tale states that St. Leonard asked that the adders be made deaf. There's a folk tale in Sussex that the adders have a legend written upon their belly that states, If I could hear as well as see, no mortal man should master me. Of course, there's no evidence that St. Leonard was ever in England, but it is a wonderful folktale. And as he was appearing to prisoners well after his death, who's to say he couldn't have appeared in England and dealt with this dragon? It's such a wonderful story, and I just imagine this path of white lilies springing up behind the wounded saint. And it is from that image that this podcast got its name. Long after St. Leonard's death, there appeared a story about another dragon in St. Leonard's forest. In 1614, a pamphlet was printed, Warning of the Monster. True and Wonderful, a discourse relating a strange and monstrous serpent or dragon, lately discovered and yet living, to the great annoyance and diverse slaughters of both men and cattle, by his strong and violent poison in Sussex, two miles from Horsham, in a wood called St. Leonard's Forest, and thirty miles from London, this present month of August 1614, with the true generation of serpents. In Sussex, there is a pretty market town called Horsham, near unto it a forest called St. Leonard's Forest, and there in a vast and unfrequented place, heathy, vaulty, full of unwholesome shades and overgrown hollows, where this serpent is sought to be bred. But whosoever bred, certain and too true it is, that there it yet lives." Within three or four miles compass are its usual haunts, oft times a place called Faygate, and it hath been seen within a half mile of Horsham, a wonder, no doubt, most terrible and noisome to the inhabits thereabouts. There it is always in its track or path, left a glutinous and slimy matter, as by a small similitude we may perceive in a snail's, which is very corrupt and offensive to the scent, insomuch that they perceive the air to be putrefied withal, which must needs be very dangerous." For though the corruption of it cannot strike the outward part of man unless heated into his blood, yet by receiving it in any of our breathing organs, the mouth or nose, it is by authority of all authors, writing in that kind, mortal and deadly, as one thus saith. 
Noxia serpentum est admixtu sanguin pestis. The serpent, or dragon as some call it, is reputed to be nine feet, or rather more in length, and shaped almost in the form of an axle tree of a cart, a quantity of thickness in the middest and somewhat smaller at both ends. The former part, which he shoots forth as a neck, is supposed to be an L long, with a white ring, as it were, of scales about it. The scales along its back seem to be blackish, and so much that it is discovered under his belly appears to be red. For I speak of no nearer description than that of a reasonable ocular distance, for coming too near it hath already been too dearly paid for, as you shall hear hereafter. It is likewise discovered to have large feet, but the eye may be there deceived, for some suppose that serpents have no feet, but glide upon certain ribs and scales, which both defend them from the upper part of their throat unto the lower part of their belly, and also cause them to move much the faster. For so this doth, and rids way as we call it, as fast as a man can run. He is of countenance very proud, and at the sight of men or cattle will raise his neck upright, and seem to listen and look about with great arrogancy. There are likewise on either side of him discovered two great bunches, so big as a large football, and as some think will in time grow to wings. But God, I hope, will, to defend the poor people in the neighborhood, that he shall be destroyed before he grows so fledge. He will cast his venom about four rods from him, as by woeful experience it was proved on the bodies of a man and woman coming that way, who afterwards were found dead, being poisoned and very much swelled, but not preyed upon. Likewise, a man going to chase it, as he imagined, to destroy it with two mastiff dogs, as yet not knowing the great danger of it, his dogs were both killed, and he himself glad to return with has to preserve his own life. Yet this is to be noted, that the dogs were not preyed upon, but slain and left whole. For his is thought to be, for the most part, a coney warren, which he much frequents, and it is found much scanted and impaired in the increase it is wont to afford. These persons, whose names are here under printed, have seen this serpent, besides diverse others, as the carrier of Horsum, who lieth at the White Horse in Southwark, and who can certify the truth of all that has been here related. John Steele, Christopher Holder, and a widow woman dwelling near Faygate. If you found The Flowered Path through Strange Familiars, you're probably acquainted with me and my art, but for new listeners, here's a little bit about me. I'm an illustrator, an author, a musician, and obviously a podcast creator. Everything you hear is researched, recorded, and produced by me. I designed the logo and did the illustration of St. Leonard for this episode. If you enjoyed this podcast and you would like to help me make more content, please consider supporting The Flowered Path via Patreon. You can find that at patreon.com slash thefloweredpath. I'm going to make extra audio content for Patreon supporters, including stories, songs, and the occasional extra episode of The Flowered Path. For patrons at the $25 a month or higher level, the Orchid tier at Patreon, I will occasionally be sending out physical merchandise like stickers, art prints, prayer cards, and more. Perhaps even t-shirts and records. We'll see as we go on. Orchid tier supporters will also get behind-the-scenes updates on my creative projects and process. The more patrons the Flower Path gets, the more it can grow and the more content I can make. Check out patreon.com slash thefloweredpath. My sources for this episode can be found in the show notes at thefloweredpath.com. The closing song for this episode is Stonebreath's version of Red Footsteps, a song I wrote for St. Leonard. Thanks for listening to The Flowered Path. I'll be back soon with another episode. The Flower Path is a production of Dark Howler Arts, art, music, books, podcasts, and more. You can find The Flower Path at thefloweredpath.com, on Facebook at facebook.com slash thefloweredpath, and on Instagram at thefloweredpath. Gathering flowers
dragon, the worm of hell, all in this forest once did dwell. Until a hermit, tarmed with prayer, followed the dragon unto his lair. And suffering poison and biting Your red footsteps from drops of blood 